Well, good morning. Thanks for coming in for part two of White Noise. Uh, today, the topic is going to be something we all have dealt with or will be dealing with, or maybe right now some of you are in the midst of dealing with this, but I want to talk about loneliness today. And as I say loneliness, about 90% of you shut your brains down because you're like, I'm not lonely. And everybody in the room goes, I'm not lonely. I'm actually sitting with somebody right now. Look, I'm not lonely. And we've got to kind of, let's be honest. When I say lonely or loneliness, we all think about this stereotype in our mind. Like you have a picture of what a lonely person looks like and it's not you. Like you have a picture of loneliness and it usually looks like a single person, a person who's not dating anybody and not married and is living alone and, and hardly ever goes out. And when they go to work, they don't really have anybody to sit with. Or when they go to school, they're just kind of loners. And, and maybe they live in the basement of their parents' house or whatever it is. But when you think of loneliness, you've got a stereotype. You've got somebody in your mind when you think of, oh man, that person's lonely. But you never really think about yourself being lonely. And what's interesting about that is that we know from research that loneliness is becoming sort of a, a regular thing for our culture. In fact, I was looking up some studies on this, and health insurer Cigna took a nationwide survey, and in that survey, they surveyed 20,000 adults across our nation. And they found that 54% of those respondents said that they feel like no one actually knows them well. They... 54% of you guys in this room, according, according to survey results, believe that nobody really knows you well. And I think that's the way we have to redefine loneliness for what we're going to talk about today. See, loneliness isn't about being a loner. Loneliness is about feeling like you are not known. Loneliness is about feeling like nobody really understands you and knows who you are. And that's kind of funny when you think about it, right? Because all of us in the room have what we call friends on Facebook, or we have followers on Instagram, or we add people on Snapchat. And some of you have like over a thousand people on Facebook that say they're your friends or connected to you. And some of you have like thousands of followers on Instagram, and those people wait for you to post about whatever food you're eating or your funniest thing your cat did this week, which is really ridiculous, but my daughter loves that stuff, right? And so we've got this whole idea of connectedness, and yet... 54% of us say we feel lonely. Isn't that something? That's why we're doing this, this series called White Noise. Because I, I think that a lot of times we're using white noise. We talked about last week. We're using things in our lives that are going to try and push us away from the feelings that are coming from inside of us. Our loneliness, our boredom, our guilt, our anger, our jealousy. Those things that we don't want to have to deal with. We, we fill up the gap in our lives and try to ignore and push away. That, that white noise is, is, is able to push away all those feelings to the background, and we can ignore them because of all these other things we do. Social media, TV, Netflix, work, information, news, whatever it is that we can make sure we're focused on besides what's coming out of our hearts. And so we said this last week. Here's how we kind of said it. Our constant access to information, entertainment, and work has disconnected us from ourselves. It, we've, we've pushed ourselves to the limit so that we don't have to pay attention to what we're feeling or why we're feeling it. And some of you in this room, I hope today you'll understand better your loneliness. I hope today that you'll understand a little bit better about how you really do feel disconnected even though you are so connected in our digital world. So what I don't want you to walk away though is thinking that I'm trying to convince you that you're lonely because that would be really awkward, wouldn't it? Like, oh, gosh, you didn't know you're lonely, but you really are lonely. Trust me, you're lonely. That's not what today's about. In fact, some of you are, are, are starting to kind of feel like this is like going to be a, an accusation against you. Like, oh, my gosh, he's going to try and tell me I'm lonely and I'm going to feel totally put upon. And th some of you in the room, listen, there's some of you who are feeling really, really lonely right now. And you think I'm making light of your situation. I just want you to know up front, listen, today's topic, I understand and I think God understands in a way that you've possibly never, ever seen before. And I don't want you going away from here believing, because we tend to do this, that loneliness is somehow your fault. I don't want you to walk away thinking what I'm telling you is that you're lonely because you want to be lonely, because you won't step out and do something. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. This is not to make you feel terrible about yourself, because if you feel lonely, here's what I want you to tell you. You, you for your whole life have thought this is your problem. And you think it's something you can solve. Because let's, let's face it, if you're lonely and you feel lonely, you feel like it's something you should be able to solve yourself. 
because it's only you that's feeling it and nobody else seems to notice. And you tend to look at other people and go, they don't understand me. My parents, they don't get it. My friends, they don't get it. They say they're my friends, but honestly, they just don't really know me as well as I think they should know me. And I feel alone in this. And, and I have all these de- questions and doubts about myself. And why can't I feel this? Why can't It looks like I have lots of people. I even go to concerts and I hang out and lunch with people. And I do all these fun things all the time with all these people. And yet I still feel alone. I, I don't want you to walk away feeling guilt about that. Because here, here's the bottom line for today that I want you to remember, that loneliness is an invitation, not an accusation. Loneliness is actually an invitation. And when I heard a guy talk about this phrase, and I stole this phrase from somebody else, it hit home with me. This is why loneliness is so powerful in our lives. Because we believe loneliness, when we say somebody is lonely, we look at it and think everybody's pointing their fingers at us, and we're over here by ourselves. But the emotion of loneliness was not created so that you would feel like you're all alone and you're by yourself. And and when loneliness, you feel like you want to withdraw even more. No, no, no. Loneliness is created as an invitation. An an invitation to what, you ask? I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you for asking that. It's an invitation to intimacy. See, we... With our likes and our retweets and our friends and all this stuff in the digital world, what, what loneliness is not an invitation to is to connect with more people. See, I think we get confused sometimes. We, we feel lonely or alone and we think, oh, I've got to go find some new friends. I've got to make sure I connect with more people. Guys, that's like walking a path and deciding that in order to make this path more fun, we just need to make it wider so that more people can walk on it with you. Rather than just having a few people to walk that path with you, to really talk and enjoy the moment with. Because when you walk with a crowd, you even feel more alone. Because you look around and it looks like everybody else is enjoying the time with everybody else, and then you feel like you're the only one left. But what if you looked at loneliness as an invitation? An invitation for you to to get to know somebody at a level beyond just the surface. What if this loneliness you're feeling is more like a way for to remind you that you need to find the people in your life? And honestly, find the way that God connects with you in your life so that you don't feel alone anymore. That you find an intimacy with the people around you that really fulfills you. Here's what I know about other research. I've been reading a book called iGen. It's by um, a Dr. Judy Twenge. And Judy Twinge does this whole research on uh, these longitudinal studies done on uh, even baby boomers, Gen X, uh, millennials, and right now the current generation who's in high school. And she's done all these studies. And these, these studies have been done for 50 years just studying teenage and college life. And one of the things I found really interesting is that because in the last decade, uh, phones have become just the, the, the thing of how we connect, this generation, this current generation of college students and high school students, when they're, when they're asked uh, in these private surveys in comparison to the other generations before them, they are less happy with their relationships. You want to know why? They spend about seven hours less a time, less, sorry, seven fewer hours a week with people face-to-face than previous generations have. Seven hours fewer per week face-to-face with people. And so while they feel connected to people, they do not feel like they know anyone and that anyone feels like they know them. And happiness, as we know, is connected to how well we feel connected to people. And so they're saying that, that students right now in high school who have more hours connecting with people face-to-face versus on their phones or on some kind of digital device are, are 20% more likely to say that they are happy in life. Now, I tell you all that sad stuff to say this. God is inviting us into intimacy with Him. In fact, He... He knows what loneliness feels like. He, he, and you're like, how can God feel lonely? Well, through Jesus' experience on earth, as we're going to look at today, there is a loneliness that Jesus understood that many of us don't get even in ourselves. And we don't see it in ourselves. And yet Jesus saw it, and he called it out, and he said, I want you to know that I want you to be a part of my life. I want you to be your. I want to be intimate with you. I want to be your friend. I want to be close to you. I want to call you out of loneliness. Loneliness is my invitation to you. And I don't want you to ever thought about it. But how we're going to get into this story is we're going to talk about how Jesus called some of his first followers. He told them to come follow me. 
And if you think about first century Israel, this is very interesting because you don't think about this as an American or living in this world, but the Jewish people this time were very lonely. They were, they were a lonely group of people. They were ruled by the Romans. The Romans had occupied their entire country. Jerusalem itself was, was basically the centerpiece of Jewish life, but Rome ruled that. And the only thing that kept Jewish life kind of seeming normal was that the, the Jewish king, he, he was fine with Roman rule because he kept to keep, got to keep his crown and he got to keep his taxes flowing in. And the Jewish religious leaders of the day, they, as long as the temple was working, they didn't mind Rome being around. As long as they left the temple alone, they were happy because they kept people coming in and, and they were making money off the sacrifices they were doing. So the leaders and the religious people with clout were, were just fine. But the regular everyday person felt cast aside. They, they felt like God had forgotten them. The regular everyday person was just trying to figure out how do, we, how do we fit between this Roman rule and these Jewish leaders who also want something from us? How do, how do we fit in this world? And they felt completely cast aside and outcast. And so we pick up the story, where we're going to start today, is we pick up the story where Jesus is starting to call his first followers, his first disciples, the first people to say, come follow me. I want you to watch what happens with this. He says, finding Philip, Philip he said to him, follow me. And Philip like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Hey, friend, friend, come with me. I found the guy. He's invited me to follow him. I don't know why, but we found the... And the Nazareth, this is how, Nathanael, it's so, so good. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. This is, this is, so, this is so human, right? Like, you found the Messiah? Oh, okay. Okay. Nazareth, can anything good from there? Like, that's like saying, Akron, Ohio, <laughs> the greatest basketball talent of our generation will come from Akron, Ohio. Are you kidding me? Like, that, like LeBron James came from Akron, people. Like, it's like, it's like saying, you know, LeBron James comes out of Akron. We well, would expect a LeBron James to come out of Miami or Los Angeles or, or Boston or New York or some got major urban city where all these things happen. No, he comes out of Akron. What is in Akron? Does anybody know anything? I don't know of anything else in Akron other than that's where LeBron James came from, right? And so Nathaniel's like, Nazareth? You found the Messiah in Nazareth? That's podunk. There's nothing there. There's no, like this, the skepticism of Nathaniel just comes straight out. And this is, this is what I love about this story. The humanity of this story. As we look at Nathaniel just, just totally throwing off Philip's invitation. Philip has one simple phrase an answer to Nathaniel's skepticism. Watch this. Come and see, said Philip. Just, hey, just, just come and see for yourself. I think this is interesting. Because a lot of us are caught in this very thing when we think about Jesus. See, we have all these doubts and these questions and the skepticism about what Jesus can do for us. We, we, we tend to, to hide those real doubts and questions, especially in a church setting, because we don't want to look like we're weird because we have questions and doubts and skepticisms, and so we kind of play the church game and we kind of slide on the radar, but really what we're thinking behind the scenes is, I'm lonely, I'm hurting. How's Jesus going to help that? Like, Jesus, Jesus is going to help me? Like, the, the total church answer for today would be, what you're expecting me to hear me say is that Jesus is here for you, you don't have to feel lonely, Right? But some of you in your mind are going, I don't, I don't see it. I'm not quite there yet. And the problem with that attitude is that you're not willing to bring your skepticism and your doubt and your questions forward. Because when you're lonely or when you're hurting or when, you're, when you feel ostracized and outcast, guess what your tendency to do? Guess what Nathaniel's tendency to do here in this situation is? Stand back and watch it all unfold from the back. Or just run the other way. Because when you're lonely, doesn't, doesn't it feel horrible to have somebody ask you, are you lonely? No, I'm not lonely. You get all defensive. That's how I get. You feel kind of lonely. No, I don't feel lonely. Why would you say I'm lonely? Lonely, lonely is an accusation. I'm not lonely. I don't feel any loneliness. No, no, no. I'm just fine. You just don't understand me. Right? And then all these questions and doubts and skepticisms we keep to ourselves because we're afraid to open up to anybody and be vulnerable and talk about our real issues. Because if we talk about our real issues, those people are going to think we're really, really, really bad off. And then we're stuck. 
Then we're stuck in the middle of, a, of this sensation that tells us you really are alone. Man, nobody feels like you feel right now. Some of you right now, you, you're, you're not honest with your parents about what you do on the weekends because you know what your parents are going to say about it. And you won't be honest with them because you go and do this stuff and you don't feel any better and it doesn't feel any better about your life and you know it's not positive, but you get home and you have that whole guilt feeling, but you're not going to tell them because if you tell them, then you really are in bad shape. And some of you won't talk to your spouse about the loneliness you feel because if you talked about your loneliness to your spouse, you know they'll start to feel guilty and you're like, I'm not good enough for you, I'm not enough for you, I, I, don't, I don't make you feel, I don't, know. I don't know how to explain it. And you don't know how to explain it, so you don't say a thing. And you stay private and closed in, and it just kind of pushes you farther away. Because once you get to feeling lonely, you start to put up real big walls, right? Because you got to make sure and protect what you've got. And so here's what some of us tend to do. We get to feeling really lonely. And so in order not to look lonely, like the stereotype we described earlier, that this person that's kind of alone, then we go out and do stuff, a lot of stuff. And we get all this white noise going in our life because, hey, if I'm going to concerts and I'm posting about it on Instagram and if I can make sure I can Snapchat all my buddies and let them know how great my life is and look at all the stories I'm sending and look at all, man, I'm going to post this on Facebook so my mom knows I'm not lonely. And, man, we, we just put out this whole front. And, man, we are just busy, busy, busy. And you're like, how can I be lonely? I've got friends that I go to lunch with three times a week, and I do this on Saturday mornings, and I've got, I've got a full schedule. Man, I'm a busy, busy, busy person. But, man, in the back of your mind, You've never stopped to consider one time that maybe that's loneliness pushing you to be busy. And what if loneliness is actually calling you to intimacy? What if it's about being honest with what you're really feeling in yourself? Because, again, as stats say, half of us in this room don't feel like anybody knows us. Now, Nathaniel makes a really smart, wise choice here. He looks at the challenge he gets from his friend Philip, and he takes the challenge. He takes his questions, his skepticisms, and his, ah, I'm not so sure about Jesus. And he just goes to check it out for himself. Look at this. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. Jesus sees Nathanael coming like, oh, this guy, this guy has no, this is truly an Israelite with no deceit. Now, this is interesting. This is what we talked about last week. If you weren't around last week, you need to go back and listen last week. But last week, I'm going to see if anybody, I'm going to quiz everybody. This is crowd participation. You ready? We read Matthew 5, 8, and it said, blessed are the, well, we got one genius, gifted, and talented student right down in front. Right? Pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will they will see God. The pure in heart will see God. What does Jesus call Nathaniel here? A person of no deceit. Here comes a guy who's bringing all his doubts, his questions, and his skepticism straight to me. Here's a guy who's pure of heart. He's not trying to hide his questions. He's not trying to hide away. He's bringing all this insecurity and this, this weirdness and this loneliness. He's bringing it to me. Oh, there's a guy. Now, there's a guy I can work with. This is so interesting because all of you in this room who are feeling lonely, you know what you believe? You don't believe you can come to Jesus with the questions and the doubts you have about whether or not he can help you not feel lonely anymore. And so you stay away from Jesus because you're not sure. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Bring the, bring the questions, bring the skepticism, you bring it on. And watch, watch how this next piece goes. Nathaniel. Now, there's three ways you can read this question. All right, you ready? One is this. How do you know me? Like, how is it, how is it that you know me? Because this happens to me a lot of times in Murray. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've been living here for almost 20 years now. And sometimes I'll, I, I was a high school English teacher, and I taught students for 15 years. And, and I, I, sometimes I don't remember your name, students. I'll be honest with you. I don't remember your name, but I remember you. I remember your personality. I remember you. So just remember that. I remember you, not your name. But somebody will come up to me and say, hey, Mr. Martin, how are you? And I'll be like, how do you know me? Because I can't remember which school it was I met you. Or which, it happens all the time. So there's this, how do you know me? Like, do you know my parents, Jesus? Like, did you talk to them? Like, like how do you know who I am? Right? Did you talk to Philip? Philip fill you in? There's another way you could read this. Well, how do you know me? Right? 
the defensiveness. Well, how do you know me? Like, you don't know me from anybody. Don't presume to know me. Don't presume to think you know anything about me. There's one more way. Well, how do you know me? Like, of all these people that, that you talk to and see, I, I've, just, I've watched you, Jesus. I've seen you walking through the streets, and people really want to talk to you. You got baptized just a couple weeks ago there. John the Baptist baptized I saw all that. It was amazing. How do you, how do you know me? Why, why would you pay attention to me? I'm just, I'm just a guy. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just Nathaniel. Look at this next piece. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip even called you. Whoa. I saw you. It wasn't because Philip brought you to me. I, I saw you before that. I saw you standing in the fig tree. Let me ask you something. Why was Nathaniel under the fig tree? It kind of begs the question, right? Why was, why was Nathaniel out under the fig tree? You know, you know what that means? Let's, let's just do some logical conclusions here. He wasn't at work. Unless that one fig tree was his work. I don't know. Maybe that was it. But he wasn't at work. He wasn't doing anything productive. He wasn't out doing things and harvesting or fishing or doing any of those things. He wasn't at the temple. He wasn't, he wasn't worshiping. He wasn't bringing sacrifices. He wasn't trying to do anything like that. So he, he wasn't at the temple. He wasn't at home. He wasn't with his family, playing with kids, whatever games you played with kids. I don't know. He wasn't, he wasn't helping, helping his dad build anything or reconstruct something. He, he wasn't there doing anything. He was just out under a fig tree. Let me ask you a question. Where do you go when you're lonely? Well, you go to a place where you know you can be alone. And I think Nathaniel was feeling lonely that day. And he went out to the fig tree, just be alone. Man, I'm tired of all this pressure. I'm tired of all these people looking, looking like they're having such great lives. I just, I just need some time alone. And in that moment, Jesus saw him. And some of you right now, you do not believe for a second that God can see you where you are. You believe that your situation, your finances, that it feels so lonely. Man, all my friends are able to get this stuff and they're able to have a house and I'm just still sitting in this apartment, man. Man, I feel so alone. Nobody understands the struggles I'm going through trying to find the right kind of job and trying to find the right kind of place to, to build my career. And it's just not happening for me. And everybody else has got it going on. And I'm just sitting over here all alone. And man, all my, all my friends, they've got, they've got three kids now and we're still waiting for one. Man, we've been waiting for years and we're pursuing all these different avenues. But man, we're still waiting. We're waiting in an adoption line. We're waiting in a fostering line. We're, we're waiting in a, just for, God, where, where are the kids? feel so alone. You're not, you're not hearing me. Yeah, I, I'm so alone. My kids have gone off to school. My spouse has gone on to the next world. and I, I, Yeah, I have people to hang out with, but I feel alone. I just, I, nobody really sees me. Nobody sees me where I am. Jesus says, I see you. This is the thing. Je Jesus sees you. You realize that, right? I mean, Jesus sees you right where you are. Where you are is not a surprise to him. He knows where you are. He is asking you to come to him. He, the, the loneliness you feel is not an accusation against you. Jesus isn't looking at you like, man, why are you so lonely? He's looking at you going, why are you lonely? Come to me. I'm with you. I'm with you the entire way. This is so crazy, right, to think about. This is unbelievable, and many of you, I know you're, you're doubting this whole deal. Look, bring your doubts to Jesus. Bring your doubts to him. Bring your doubts all the way to Jesus, and test him in this one. Can Jesus see you or not? Now, here's, here's the crazy thing. Jesus, Jesus goes, go back, go back to the next verse, verse 40, uh, yeah, 49. Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Like he's pretty quickly convinced, right? His skepticism, his doubt flies out the window at this moment. Here he is in the middle of this and he's like, oh my gosh, you saw me under the fig tree? Well, you must be the son of God. 
Watch Jesus' example. It's the same as our, our response. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? Well, you'll see greater things than that. You'll see a lot, a lot greater things than that. This, this is what you've got to understand about Jesus. Jesus sees you where you are. And it's not just that he just wants to be with you. He wants to tell you that he knows exactly who you are. That you are known for who you are. And the greater things he has for you come after you admit that you need him. So he, here's the crazy thing. These greater things, I want you to think about this for a second. Nathaniel followed Jesus for three years. And he watched Jesus heal the lame, people who could not walk. They regained control of their legs. He watched blind people regain sight. He watched Jesus raise not one, not two, but three people from the dead. He watched Jesus feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. He watched Jesus walk on water, which is pretty legit. I mean, let's be honest. If I had to see one miracle, I'd want to see the water walking one, right? You'll see greater things than this, Nathaniel. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but all of those miracles that Jesus did, even the walking on water one, we always think of them as fulfilling a physical thing, like it's a physical need. Oh, they got food. Oh, they got legs. Oh, they got eyes. Oh, they got life. It's a physical thing. Guess what? In all of those instances, think about it. Jesus wasn't just, just healing a physical problem. He was letting that blind person know, I see you, even though you can't see me. I know your blindness. I, I know your legs don't work. I see you where you are. Hey, the lepers on the side of the road, it yelled out to Jesus, 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 I see you lepers. I understand that everybody else is going to pass you by, but, but I see you where you're at. Do you realize Jesus' miracles of what he did was not just a physical thing, it was an inward thing for all of those people. The woman who reached and just grabbed the hem of his robe, it talks about just, she just, she believed if she could just touch his clothing, she would be healed from her disease. And when she touched his clothes, Jesus said, wait, wait, somebody touched me. Was it you? I see you. Jesus' miracle was not that he healed people from their physical ailments. The real miracle was that Jesus healed people from their loneliness. I want you to think about this for a second. The greatest thing Jesus did was the loneliest thing he ever did. See, when Jesus went to the cross, he was arrested with all of his friends hanging around in the garden, and he was the only one taken, and they all scattered and left. And Peter kind of snuck in to see, but while Jesus was being interrogated by the, by the chief priest, Peter took off and said, no, no, I don't know who he is. And he denied him three times and ran. And then when Jesus was dragged in to be beaten by the Roman soldiers and then interrogated again by Pilate, nobody came to his defense. And then when Jesus had to carry his own cross, they made one guy carry the cross because he physically wasn't able to carry it up the hill. So they got him to the cross and they nailed him up there. And nobody came to his defense. The loneliest thing Jesus ever did was the greatest thing he ever did. But he did it so you would never have to be lonely again. See, the greatest miracle of Jesus' life is not that he did some amazing physical miracles. It's the greatest miracle of his life was that he made sure you'd never be alone. He went alone to the cross so you wouldn't have to. And you'll notice more than that. Some of you are like, well, I'm not lonely. That's okay. While Jesus was going to the cross and on the cross, do you know who Jesus was thinking about the whole time? Other people. Example A, the thief next to him. Remember this part? He's hanging on the cross. The other guy being crucified right next to him goes, Hey, I've heard you have a kingdom beyond this life. I know I've done wrong things, but man, if you're really who you say you are, can you hook me up? <laughs> And Jesus goes, yep, you'll be with me today in paradise. And then standing below him as he's dying, he notices his mother. Jesus, as the oldest male child of his mother, was, it was his responsibility to take care of her. And in those moments, as he can barely, guys, as he can barely breathe, he had to push himself up onto the nails with his feet in excruciating pain throughout his chest. And he had to say, John, take care of my mother. She's yours now. He thought of her. Why in the world would you be thinking about her? You're suffering. And then he thought about the people who put him there. 
One of the last words he said was, Father, would you forgive them? Because they don't know what they're doing. And then his very last words were, My God, my God, why have you left me? You know what I think? I think the real cure for loneliness, it's not an accusation against us. The real for, cure for loneliness is for us to come to Jesus and realize that he knows us. You know, despite all your questions and your doubt, what you really want to know is you want to know that somebody is with you. And Jesus has always been with you. He has been with you through it all. And we ignore that because we would rather turn on Spotify really loud in our headphones or turn on Netflix for three or four hours than to recognize that our Savior is with us. We use white noise to confuse our emotions so we don't have to feel them. And yet we have a solution that is so close to us, we tend to ignore it. And those of us who don't feel lonely, guess what? Here's the challenge of today. The real challenge is this. You should be looking where God is looking so that we can see the people he sees. And by the way, lonely people, once you come to Jesus and you realize that he does know you, it should empower you to know that now you can know other people who don't feel known, who feel outcast, who feel alone. One of the greatest cures for loneliness is to look past our own need and see the needs of others. That's what Jesus modeled for us all the way to the end of his life. And it's what we need to be modeling to every single person in this world who does not feel like anyone knows them. There are people you work with who have no one. There are people in your family, while they're at every family function, feels like nobody really knows them. And loneliness is threatening to pull them away from everything that is good for them. But Jesus sent you. The hope of the world, guys, is that we as the church understand that if Jesus is with us, then we can be with them. If Jesus is with me, then I can be with them. If Jesus is really with me, no one else around me should ever feel lonely because I know I am never alone. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to test this out this week. If you feel lonely, I want you to take your eyes off yourself for just a few minutes. I want you to look for the loneliest person that you know around you. And I want you to go and remind them that they are not alone. I want you to go to them and remind them because, because you can go in the power that Jesus is with you. So you can go in confidence. And though, though you don't feel like you have confidence, you can just know that you have Jesus with you. That's what faith looks like. So I have, I have students all the time ask me what, what faith really looks like. And faith just looks like this. Despite what you feel, you go on the truth that Jesus told you. And you act on it as if it's true. That's all that faith is. And so this morning, my challenge for you is this. If you feel lonely, do not think of it as an accusation. Think of it as an invitation to in intimacy. And that intimacy can come with your heavenly Father through Jesus. And it can come by making sure that everyone else around you knows that they are not alone. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this message. Thank you that you have never left us. You've never put anything between us and you. That you died so that we could be with you. God, thank you this morning that you remind me that I am not alone when I feel so terribly alone. My doubts and my skepticism are welcome as long as I bring it to you. God, I pray for people here today who need to know that somebody is with them. God, I pray that they will feel your presence, that they will know the truth that you are with them. And God, I pray that as a church, that we would look to the outcast. We would see the people on the fringe. We would see the people who are, who are hurting and alone and out there dealing with things that we can't even understand. And God, we would go and let them know that we are for them because you are for us. And let that message ring so clear in all of our lives this week as we go throughout our days. In your son's name we pray. Amen.